welcome to the special edition of Her Will's Life and Leadership series in celebration of the International Women's Day, the global UN theme for which in 2021 happens to be Women in Leadership. For a South Asian woman to become a female leader, there is a strict set of norms that apply in order for them to achieve a likability status. If they don't mould themselves into these fixed structures, they're neither loved nor respected, even by the ones closest to them. They could be running a state, owning a business, becoming global successes. However, until or unless they exemplify the qualities of a good, homely South Asian woman, all, other, all their other achievements in life becomes invalid. And to declare war, a cultural revolution against these societal norms, we have with us as a guest speaker tonight, the most renowned feminist activist of our time, the legend herself, Gamla Parson. Our guest speaker tonight cannot be reduced to any length of words. So this is only a feeble attempt on my part to introduce her to you. Gamla Bhasin is a feminist activist, poet, author, and social scientist from India. Her main body of work for 45 years has been capacity building of activists, gender sensitization workshops, and campaigning. In particular, Gamla Bhasin acts as a tireless advocate for Indian and South Asian women and their right to equality. Bhasan is associated with Sangat, a feminist network, Jagori Resource and Training Center in New Delhi, and Jagori Rural Charitable Trust. She's the global co-chair of Peace Women Across the Globe. She has achieved high praise for her poem titled, Kyuki Man Lurki Hu Mujhe Parna Hai, Because I'm a Girl, I Must Study. Her other feminist works and children's books, some of which have been translated into nearly 30 languages. Additionally, Pasan is the South Asian coordinator of One Billion Rising, a global campaign dedicated to ending rape and sexual violence against women. Salam namaste and a warm welcome to you, Kamladi. I cannot begin to tell you how honored how thoroughly honoured we feel to have you speaking for us today. Um, I just want to start off with this famous quote of yours where you said, what India needs today is a cultural revolution. And I think it's safe to say that it applies to all of South Asia. You know, when the Christchurch mosque attacks happened um, in New Zealand back in 2019, a lot of South Asians came out in full support and continue to love and admire the New Zealand's Prime Minister, um, Jacinda Ardern. At the time, there was an interesting post viral in social media, I remember, that said, what would have happened to Jacinda? Was she born in South Asia? Firstly, she's unmarried, becomes pregnant while she's head of state, has a child with her partner, a man she's not married to. Her male partner gives up his day job to stay home and look after the baby. We have basically become a fan of a woman whose very existence probably would not be accepted in a South Asian community. So on that note, we'd love to kickstart our conversation tonight on female leadership and like to ask you to take us back to the start of your journey. 45 years, it's very impressive. What were you frustrated with? What were your motivations? Give it to us all, the good, bad and ugly. Right, so first of all, equality, justice, dignity and human rights, Zindabad for everybody. And secondly, I'm really happy to be with her will. And I am an admirer of Jacinda. 
And I can identify with her in many, many ways. I did not become the prime minister of any country, but like her, I also broke many norms. And actually nothing happened to me now. Even in South Asia, I mean, 70 years ago, as a little girl, I broke every norm in that village by playing only with boys outside. Only because my family did not stop me. So sometimes it is not South Asia which stops us. Because the Adivasi women, the Adivasi girls do exactly what any free child would do. And then as a young woman, once again, I did things which no one in my family had ever done. And see, I'm still alive, thriving. I married a man whom I didn't want to marry and then I left him. I was the first person in my entire clan to do a divorce because for me, my life was really, really important and not a bad choice. And after that, I lived with a man without marrying him for seven years in the most conservative Rajasthan. Still alive. So I really want to say that there are pockets in South Asia. There are people in South Asia, whether it's Bangladesh, Pakistan. I mean, look at a woman in Pakistan like Asma Jahangir. Look at women in Dhaka, Bangladesh, even in villages. There's a friend of mine called Shelly. I mean, she is so bindas. She lives in a village. She wears trousers one day, sari the other day. She drives a motorcycle. So really, I haven't uh, felt a total, but yes, we were islands, and I think Jacinda is also pretty much an island in an ocean which is still patriarchal. So you see, I see patriarchy, Nas, as a global system. It is, a, you know, stronger somewhere, even within a country. And I cannot really generalize India or Bangladesh. And for me, based on my experiences now of 50 years, I find the freest women are still the Adivasis because property and patriarchy are not that strong there. It is people with properties who control their daughters much more and some so, and yes, some of our leaders, they go the feminine way as soon as they become heads of states, like in Bangladesh. I mean, women who had never covered their heads as the wife of an army officer or studying in England and living in London, never covered her head, but as soon as they become and then they start covering their head, whereas we expect them to give us the freedom. But for votes, they go the other way around. And even our Prime Minister Indira Gandhi is supposed to have said that she was not a feminist. You know, and you feel bad, you know, you, you, you feel, my God, if they would just ask us what it means, we could have told them. <laughs> rather, than make a, rather than make a statement, which pushes us back by decades. So yes, these are all global issues, unfortunately. And uh, we have a few wonderful women. And I'm so glad that during COVID-19, six of these women heads in the world have been talked about. And not just these, millions of other women who are at the forefront of fighting COVID. Absolutely. I think women and men leaders are everywhere. 
some visible, some invisible. And if I look at the history of post Mukti Juddho Bangladesh, 1971, I mean, I can give you a list of hundreds of women who've been the most amazing leaders. And not just women, men who've been leaders for gender equality. Yeah. People like Zafarullah Chaudhary, people like Fazle Ahmed Abed, people like Professor Yunus, all of them working for gender equality in that country with the help of millions of Bangladeshi women. And you know, Naz, Somewhere we people like us feel that it is the rural women, uneducated women who are not leaders or who are not feminists. But my experience tells me this is false. This is a misconception of us women who can't see the realities. You know, in Bangladesh, in the top jobs, it was difficult to get women from our class. Yeah. But in the rural areas, like in the garment industry, you asked for 100,000 women, 200,000 came. But in the managerial positions, we didn't allow our daughters. We didn't educate them like that. So salute to every woman, like Jacinda, like my Mahmouda in the village, like my Asma Jahangir, and I salute them in this month of March, which has the biggest festival we feminists have, the International Women's Day. And I take this opportunity to salute every foremother and forefather who fought for us so that you and I can be in conversation on Zoom. Without them, we won't be here. Thank you so much for starting off by paying that beautiful tribute. And that's absolutely right. We have to recognize our history. And some beautiful points that you made, Kamla I have to mention, the whole middle and upper class challenges um, that women face, how different they tend to be from the rural classes or the Adivasis. Um, I loved the line that you mentioned, your life was not about a bad choice and an, us being an island in an ocean of patriarchy. What a beautiful start to our conversation. Okay. Um, moving on, my first question to you actually um, is a topic that is a long-standing issue since we have touched um, a little bit on the historical understanding of things or challenges that are endemic to South Asia, child and early marriages. Now, I'll just read out a few of the statistics from the latest UNICEF report. 30% of women are still married as child brides in South Asia. India producing one third of it globally, Bangladesh has the highest rate of marriage involving girls under 15, while Nepal has the highest rate of child marriage in Asia for both boys and girls. Child or early marriages, what we normally hear being talked about, um, you know, including some unwarranted and offensive opinions on it as well, is what the society thinks is the right age for a girl or a woman to be married or what the law believes is the right age, or what government practitioners, predominantly male, um, believes the right age should be. Again, there is a certain loss of agency there um, that a blanket law does not seem to recognize here. And that's the opinion of the woman or the girl in question. And there are individual circumstances that can apply. For example, marriages in, a, in an arranged setting it can come without a basic uh, understanding of what it means to actually carry out the relationship much beyond the feras and um, you know, our big cultural celebrations. 
there is a rule of engagement, um, that of mutual consent, sexual and emotional agency. I just want to draw your thoughts out on these issues and also how marriage sometimes gets touted as the first obstacle in the obstacle course of a woman in their journey towards leadership? Yeah, tricky question. But marriage in every culture and not just again South Asia is a patriarchal institution where basically two families exchanged their children to enhance their businesses and their properties within religion, within caste, within race. So there was no democracy. There was no question of choice. In the Christian marriage, even today, the, the most educated women are given away in marriage by the father of the bride to whom? To the bridegroom. It is exact translation of kanyadan, giving away the bride. It is exactly kanyadan, kornadan in, in, in South Asia. So to look for agency there, even for men, and this is not just about women, if I am going into an arranged marriage, my partner is going into an arranged marriage. It's not just me. And secondly, Nas, age. Is age the same for a working class child as for my child? A working class child starts working at eight, seven, nine, ten and earning a living and supporting a family all over. So by the time they're 15, they have lived half their lives and their overall mortality is so much that we live for 80 today, they're still living for 40 years, 45 years. Our children, they could be studying till 25, 30, 35 as dependents. I mean, especially our children, boys in South Asia, like little babies never growing up. But look at those working class people. So you see, the other thing is, are we living in agriculture production systems or are we in industrialized production systems? In agriculture systems all over the world, 17, 18, 16 was the marriage. It is not, I really don't think it is South Asia or Asia. What makes a difference is are we an agriculture economy or are we an industrialized economy? And all these things depend on that. Now my mother got married at 15 my grandmother had also got married at 15. So in today's legal system, they would be criminals. They would have committed a crime. Why did we, three sisters of mine, why did we not get married at 15? What happened? We went to school. We were educated. Our families could do that. Have our societies and communities done this for the whole of Bangladesh? Have we done it for India and Pakistan? We start expecting from the poorest people whom we have deprived of education, whom we have deprived of democracy, whom we have deprived of rights, and start comparing them to our daughters and say, my daughter, that's, you know, at 21. And this is about marriage, but we have been saying this about those people, about how many children they have. Mm. I can you that every European family 150 years ago had more than six children. Every. Yeah. Because they needed, they needed those children. 
My grandparents, both sides, had 11 and 14 children. My parents had seven of us. And none of us have more than three. Did some Kamla or Naz come to lecture us? No. We didn't die. We had vaccination. We went to school. So we got all this. We got nutrition, we got food, we got education. We got better health. And those people have none of these. And who is making the laws? Do we ask them what laws do you want? So, you know, I look at it extremely diff- you know, differently. And I feel if I was living in those conditions, I would do exactly what they're doing because I've not met cleverer people and cleverer managers than in any poor community. I can challenge myself that I will not be able to live there for a week in their kind of resources and circumstances. So I feel that it is a fault of the leadership. It is a fault in our democracy. We are ridden with hierarchies of patriarchy, caste, race, and class. Mm. And we, our tiny minority, creates the laws and then has this great pleasure of looking down upon 80% people because of whom we are alive. And here I must say the next thing. It is, you know, we have the planet, planetary problems. We have climate change problems. All of these problems are because of us educated, greedy, upper class people. We who believe we are global citizens We are actually the destroyers. I mean, pollution, all because of us and the rich countries. All the wars, all the wars in the last hundred years because of the richest, the most scientific countries of the world. Corruption, only those who are educated can do it. Consumption, which is killing the planet. And if we are still on this planet, it is because of those, those of us who consume hardly anything, but who grow our food, who clean our streets, and who have to bear with these judgments from us that they follow these kinds of things. So my dear, tough issues. <laughs> Such a fantastic revelation. I have to thank you, Kamladi, for bringing a different set of lenses to even, even I, I guess, the, the question that I had about marriage being an obstacle. Um, it sounds like a first world problem, you know, in, in the whole, if you put that sort of perspective on it, of the working class child, um, that reality is so different. What we are mm. talking about, and you, you've rightly said that, we are the tiniest of the minorities with the most amount of power to wield and, and all the policy making and everything resting in our hands. And, um, and, and, the, the, power, and the power now is not being used as leaders should. Absolutely. For, for me, none of these leaders whom we see are leaders. For me, my definition of leadership is completely different and will probably come to that. Um, Yeah. And, you know, even there, I was reading an article about 25 years ago about child mothers in the USA. Mm -hmm. Actually, several million girls becoming pregnant and becoming mothers 
between the ages of 13 and 16 in the USA. And the article was in the Times magazine or something. It was only about girls. Nobody talked as if, I mean, were boys involved in this story or were they all immaculate conceptions like Mother Mary? So, you know, that is the other way to go. They can get married much later, but they all need sex. We do it different, differently at 13, 14, we marry them off. Whereas they go through all this. And again, there also, I think we need to see what happens to the black, to the poor people. And you could see their condition during COVID a country which has had democracy for over 250 years. So I think we need to differentiate between these groups of people of whom we are talking. And how interconnected all the yeah. issues on climate yeah. change, consumption, capitalism, all of them patriarchy, all of them coming into that power play. I, actually kind of leads me to my next question for you, which was uh, another aspect of gender um, inequality um, in South Asia. We often talk about how girls mature faster. They take on more responsibility when they're young compared to their male counterparts. And we've seen that in most of my own family as well. The girls always get better grades in school yeah. and university. But that does not necessarily continue or translate over to the positions of power and authority that we see um, around the world. Do you want to quickly comment on this missing link? No, we are educated to find good husbands. We are not educated to become husbands. And that tells the entire story. I mean, the first of all, the word husband now. What does it mean? The word husband means the controller, manager. The husband, this word comes from animal husbandry, the same word. Animal husbandry, where you take independent, free animals and domesticate them. Earlier, we used the word the husband of the ship. It meant the captain of the ship. The husband. And when earlier on, when there were really matriarchs, women, they used to be called the husband woman. So it's exactly the same meaning, perhaps not as bad as Shami for a husband in Bangla or Pati in Hindi. They mean lords and masters, Shami. Yeah. And use them. We use them. You and I use them. Shami, if you call that fellow Shami from morning till night, he will start behaving like that. And my inner self will believe if he's a Shami, who am I? It can only be Dashi. Absolutely. Because it, otherwise it can't be. And I remember 20 years ago doing this gender workshop with Proshika. And there I talked about these words. And 20 years ago, that organization with 5,000 people, employees, we all decided we will not use the word shami or husband. We'll use the word partner. 20 years ago, it happened in Proshika, in Dhaka, nowhere else. So you see, that is the notion. And once again, I'll come back to it. It is not just in South Asia. Uh, let me take USA with most of your members would know. Now Hillary Clinton, equally qualified as her partner, he doesn't use her name. Now why does this woman, so highly educated, you know, fighting the elections for presidentship, Mrs. Clinton? Obama's wife using his name. When such women continue this, and who is to be blamed? There's no law that they need to change their names. Mm -hmm. 
Why do we change them? Because that's what we have been taught. That's what we believe in. So our degrees do not matter. Degrees do not change our patriarchal mindsets. There's a wonderful book which I am sharing with you. It's called Chup. Chup. It's a Hindi word, but the book is in English. Okay. Written by a woman called Deepa Narayan. She was with the World Bank for many years and did the largest studies on poverty. She left that and she did a study of about of upper class Indian women who went to the finest institutions for education. And she interviewed over 650. And she says in their belief systems, in their thinking, in their practices, completely patriarch. Wow. Cultural revolution not just educational revolution, because education is for a livelihood. Our education is not for a life change. I did not take my partner's name 40 years ago. All my nieces who came 30 years after me changed their names. All had an aunt like me in the family. And all the wives of my nephews all changed their names. Ask them why. And that is our inner consciousness. None of them was forced. So that's where a cultural revolution and not doing anything revolutionary, actually. All our constitutions today, NAS, whether it is Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, US, Australia, yeah. All of them say men and women are equal. So if we respect our constitutions for goodness sake, we have to stop doing this and you and I have to stop doing it. Why don't we do it? Why do we go through those horrible, obscene weddings which last for three or four days? These independent women do that natok of dressing up like that and covering their heads and their mehndis for 10 days. I mean, they're so obscene that I haven't been to a wedding all my life. Like I've attended four weddings where I couldn't avoid because of some problems. I don't go, I can't, I can't see them. The ostentation, the black money shining in those weddings. And my daughter's come back from the US. I said, yeah, that's why she's getting married like this. So, you know, this is, this book, Chup, has to be read by all of us. And we need, okay. to, see, and, and, and we need to see that we change not just our daughters. I think for me, the time to change men and boys, our sons, yeah. for me, came like 30 years ago. And that's what is necessary today. Unless these men will change, unless a man will tell his wife, listen, I'm not changing my name. Why are you changing yours? What's wrong? I don't want you to change your name. Yeah, needs to be the both ways. Mm. And gender is not about women, by the way. And gender violence is not about violence against women. Gender violence is about who does the violence because that person is the active one. Yeah. Instead of saying women are violated, we have to start saying men violate. Call a spade a spade. Men rape, not women are raped. Men rape. And they don't come from the moon, they come from your and my family. We, society, culture, we are responsible for producing rapists. When in my country people say, death penalty for rape. So I said, how many family members will you kill? Because that boy was created by us. Yeah. We created him by calling him Raja Beta, Kulka Deepak, 
you will get all the property, urinate anywhere in South Asia. That is the biggest contribution of men. They can urinate anywhere, a tree, a wall, a ground. So I think that cultural revolution is what we need. And to some extent it is happening. Absolutely. I, I have to say, I, I, I feel very inspired by, by especially that part that you said, of course, it's about men and the boys. And of course, it's about family and parenting, but it's also about ourselves. And that's what you said, you know, with the name change, be it, it's, it's the lack of questioning that we do with ourselves that needs to be the very first step. Um, you know, in terms of even the validation, that the, the fact that we still seek that from our surroundings. And that creates a lot of these challenges and that, that contributes or adds um, to a lot of challenges. And that's a lot of the conversations yeah. that we need to start having with ourselves. You know, during this, during this COVID uh, period, I haven't traveled mm. for 13 months. And I used to travel like at least four times a week, uh, a month at least. I'm going for 15 days to Bangladesh or 20 days to. So I've been here and I've written several long poems in Hindi. You know, we blame societies for saying, Log kya kahenge? Tara ki bolbe? Now that is such a completely wrong and false statement. I've seen in my life, it is not what people will say, it is my fear of people. Yes. It is my fear of culture. And I have really checked out these people at every step and I found Nothing happened to me. I carried my mother's asti on my shoulder. I gave her my shoulder when she died. And together, two sisters and two brothers went to give fire. And the pundit says, Madam, now you please move back. Let the men come give the fire. I said, Panditji, do you need your 500 rupees, which I was going to give you? or not. And in a minute he says, no, 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 come, come, come. You do what you want, you do what you want. This is their religion. In Dhaka, when, or in Pakistan, when Asma Jahangir passed on, women went for the janaza and women were there and women put her down. And Nasreen Hawk in Dhaka, when she passed on with that terrible accident, they went with the janaza. They were there. They, the women, only women were told that you will put her down and you will stand there and sing songs of liberation. In Dhaka, 10 years ago, nothing happened to them. Shirina and Zafarullah Chaudhary, they're all there. Who did it? Nobody killed them. So we do nothing and then we keep blaming South Asia, we keep blaming this and that. And so I, I really think that cultural revolution to begin with us, what is it in my practice every day, which is patriarchal? My jewelry, my cosmetics, my shoes, my language, my class, and I'm talking of equality. Do I sit with the maid who comes to my house at the same table and eat with her? What use is my lecture on equality? And this, by the way, is the biggest failure of my own life. Mm -hmm. Gender, I'm very strong. Am I? as strong when it comes to class? Do I tell them to work for seven hours, eight hours for which I fight in the garment factory? Do I do this with the daughter? I mean, the woman in my house. 
Yeah. None of us do it. You know, I have a son who is 40 years old and he is completely challenged, completely disabled. He's quadriplegic, meaning no motor function, no speech, no head control. And I live with four people who right. look out. We are a family of seven, four people. Two of them have a son who's my grandson. I can't say that when my guests come, they eat with us. And that tells you my reality. That's still what I say and what I do are far away. And that's the biggest failure of my life, of, of, of not being able to declass myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for pointing that out and sharing that, you know. Um, I believe that's exactly what you said. That needs to be the start, fighting that fear, questioning yeah. us on a daily basis. It's a daily struggle. It's, and it's not about other people. It's first about ourselves, then about our surroundings, yeah. then about the people outside the doors. So... Thank you so much, Erin. That was that was beautifully put. I'll um, go on to the next question, which we touched upon earlier, um, where you've been quoted several times saying that capitalism and patriarchy go hand in hand, a dual relationship. We've covered quite a bit of it today already, um, right. but that the, I, I love how you. We have been quoted saying this, that capitalism needs cheap labour and women are the cheapest labour. Now, that is so true. I mean, a vast majority of the work performed by women are free and thankless. Yeah. Um, and, and not just in gender, but like in any sort of labour, it's never glamorised enough. You know, we, we don't have enough gratitude um, to pay for labor and the work that with it. I, I just, I just uh, you know, hear your thoughts on that. You see, there are a dual relationship of capitalism with patriarchy. To some extent, it brought women out. Like, if you will look at the garment industry in Bangladesh, these factories who were paying nothing to these women but they liberated them from their rural backgrounds. And suddenly in Dhaka at five in the morning, you see these thousands of women walking on every road going to the factory. Now that in some way is freedom, liberation. They got that validation that this now daughter can send money back home. That daughter is earning for the family. That liberation is there to some extent. And I recognize that. And it has happened to many middle class, upper class women who are working in the corporates, always at the second, third, fourth places, always even in the US getting less wages than the men for the same work. And again, this is global. So that has also been done. But, but the bigger part is that patriarchy and capitalism work together as these terrible twins exploiting women. Now, it is we women who produce labor for the capitalists. The capitalist pays nothing. They, they claim they are paying a family wage. But they pay nothing for us who produce their labor, who produce their corporate leaders, who produce all these people who run their computers, we produce them. And the capitalist economics doesn't even consider that part of the national product, GNP. This is, our work is not part of the GNP, GDP. And what is the worth? In 1995, UNDP did a survey and we, they found that if we were to pay minimum wages for women's care work at home, 
minimum wages. It will be $11 trillion per, per year. So this is our contribution to this global economics, which is controlled by 500 billionaires. Two, three of them are now Indians, sadly. So this is capitalism. And then look at the other side, which washes away all the work feminists have done over the last three, four, five hundred or more years. Today, an in capitalism where God is profit. And the other word for profit, which is much more true, is greed. Endless greed. So pornography today is a billion dollar industry in capitalism. Child pornography. So you and I can keep talking against violence against women and rape. And what are they doing? Producing the rape culture. Move on to cosmetics, which tells all the women what beauty is. And they define beauty based on the white woman. And they will tell me I have to use fair and lovely in South Asia where the sun shines. Why the hell should I be fair? I am lovely with my darkness and my brownness. And God damn it, they do billion dollar business even in South Asia for fair and lovely. Mm -hmm. and, and statistics tell us they make 85% women who see these ads and who use cosmetics, they make us unhappy because something or the other in my body doesn't match the Barbie doll size. And move from cosmetics, a billion dollar industry, move from it to the, do to the toys industry. Guns for boys, Superman, the man, all these men for boys, and Barbie dolls for us. The most sexualized image, the most patriarchal of images, Barbie doll. Move on then to the media world, Hollywood, Bollywood, and see the stereotypes they have created in the last hundred years for making profit, nothing but profit. And you know, when I was a child, when my country got independent, I had thought that when education will come, we will talk of equality. No, the entire capitalist world is controlled by educated people. Yeah. From the finest universities. So education has nothing to do with our constitutions. Equality, justice, freedom for all. Nothing to do with that. That's what we had thought when development will come. Patriarchy will disappear. But my God, in 1947, when I was born, we didn't have blue and pink. We didn't know what is blue and pink. In our village, people still don't know. But you and I, who are now modern, we get soaps which are gendered. Even perfume is gendered. Tell me a product which is not gendered and then we are talking of gender equality. And in the evening, after finishing this, we'll go for shoes and they'll say, Madam, your child, girl or a boy, damn it, both of them have feet, give me shoes, which increase my daughter's speed and not limit her speed. Fantastic. And one, and one of your questions was about feminine clothes. That if a girl chooses feminine clothes, my question is, let us deconstruct feminine clothing let us deconstruct feminine shoes. Mm. Let us deconstruct feminine beauty products. And you'll see they're all about limiting our freedom physically. Yeah. About death in Bangladesh during floods, women who wear saris and who are ashamed die much more because of their clothing. 
because of the notion of shame. The shoes which we wear, you know, shoes are supposed to be for protection and for speed. Our shoes, shoes of the upper class women are for neither of those. They are for making our bums move left and right, those heels. I mean, in an office, why am I moving my bums? Is that how I get promotion? Why do I get dressed up like a bride when I go to an Indian office? The men are never dressed in achkans when they come, but we often are dressed like that. And then we want to be taken seriously. Mm. The, you know what I hated when I was a little girl of five? That none of my dresses had a pocket. Yeah. And what, does that, what does a pocket mean? A pocket means freedom. If whatever is in my hand, I can put in my pocket like my brother does then I can face any situation, my hands are free. Our hands are never free. And also we use those hands and those books to protect ourselves from the hands which go for, for our breasts. So you look at the clothes from the middle ages where women were given those things, they couldn't breathe. And then they were fainting and then the men were holding them, they were fainting. That was beauty. Yeah. And Chinese foot binding. This is all beauty. And the Chinese parents bound their feet. But we do it out of choice. This is my choice, these shoes. And I wonder, I wonder if in consumerism there is any choice left to us. I mean, we can fool ourselves that this is my choice. Yeah. One of a very dear friend of mine 10 years ago suddenly was wearing jeans which, which were torn at 10 places. I said, oh, wow, you paid for it, yeah. My choice. I said, then why didn't you wear it five years earlier before it became fashionable? What choice? I mean, don't fool yourselves. That Vogue magazine decides your choice every month. Mm. So I think we, middle class, upper class women really, and men, need to reflect and I, the role we are playing in promoting patriarchy. And if a woman like me goes to rural women as a worker there, and they like me, they'll become like me. So from freedom, they'll move to my kind of patriarchal lack of freedom. So it's as so we, feminists say, we feminists say, the personal is the political. So we need to begin with the personal. And that personal is cultural revolution and culture is very closely linked to religion. And we are so damn afraid to question our religions. And without questioning culture and religion, forget about equality. Just forget Absolutely. it. It's, it's good for time pass. You and I have had a nice one hour. It's good for time pass. <laughs> but it can't be serious. Yeah. And yeah. you question those things. Absolutely. No, thanks for touching upon the um, cosmetic and the porn industry. Well, um, that was one of our um, major questions tonight, that how the concept of women being reduced to just their bodies. Yeah. Um, and how you talked about the pants without pockets. I love that. And the shoes. Yeah. It's all yeah. about living our movement. It's all about, it's all about making us seek that help, that shape our own to look after carry out things for us to, you know, and um, yeah, so, so much of our beliefs and the wider system actually stems from that.
And this brings us to the end of, the, of our conversation for part one of our International Women's Day special edition of Her Will's Life and Leadership with none other than Kamla Bhasin. But please, please stay tuned and come back for the part two of our conversation shortly to catch up on some more fiery discussions around feminism and female leadership. Good night. Thank you.